the Dim Din Podcast, a safe space to talk about misconceptions, perceptions, assumptions, and frustrations. Join us for conversations and stories that explore how embracing our differences leads to a balanced, strong, and harmonious world. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dim Din Podcast, your very safe space to have conversations about misconceptions, perceptions, assumptions, and frustrations in the African community, especially here in the diaspora. I am your host, Becca, a.k.a. the Serenadian. And I have with me two beautiful guests today. We have Juliet from Ghana and Jade from Cameroon, our first Cameroonian on set, by the way. And I'm going to pass it over to them to introduce themselves before we talk about the topic of the day. Over to you, Juliet. Thank you, Patricia, for having me here. My name is Juliet. I'm originally from Nigeria. So um, I moved to Canada two years ago with my husband and two children. So we are brand new. <laughs> <laughs> we are new in the system. Um, I moved to Edmonton one year ago, and that is all about me for now. Thank beautiful, you. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Well, welcome to Canada thank two years later. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you enjoy it? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Over to you, Jade. Hi, my name is Jade. Um, I'm a mom of four fun packet about me. I'm a Cameroonian. Um, I'm a mental health therapist by profession. So I'm really glad to be here today to be part of the Dim Dim podcast. I hope we all have fun and enjoy my uh, insight and perspective about life. Beautiful, beautiful. We're off to a great start. And I had asked you ladies to tell us one fun or historical fact about your countries of birth. Okay. Do we want to go there? Yes. <laughs> okay. 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 So Please. One fun fact about Nigeria is that we have over 250 languages, mm. spoken languages, mm. out of which I speak four. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. So 250 languages? Yes. Over 250, over 250 languages 250 in Nigeria. Languages. Yes. Sierra Leone does not come close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say like Julia, like we have over 250 um, languages in Cameroon and I'm so proud that I, I speak a few, sorry. I can speak mostly like my mother's tongue. So we have like, we are from, my dad is from Menangwe, one of the villages in Cameroon. And my mom is from Oshé. I'm so proud to say that when I say that, but I speak more of the Oshé piece because the early stages of my life, I was with my grandparents from the like Matena grandparents. So they instilled that language in me. It was a must because there was no opportunity for us to even speak the pidgin that we call the pidgin language. Mm -hmm. It was all about the mother tongue. And that is the fun part about Cameroon because even some of them here, uh, I've seen some other people from different villages, they try to instill that language piece in their children and I really appreciate that. I wish I could do that with my kids, but I usually say my mother tongue is very hard. I'm glad I learned it at the age which I learned. And I try I speak that home with my husband, but my kids don't find it fun. They look at us <laughs> like we're crazy. <laughs> Beautiful. They do understand. So <laughs> that is another piece that I've always admired um, with me uh, my husband and I because we got to understand, we got to keep secret at times and tricks <laughs> trick the kids <laughs> because they don't understand that. So I'm, I'm kind of glad they don't understand that piece of us. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so over 250 languages in both Cameroon and Nigeria. Nigeria. Sierra Leone does not even make it to 15, but we're happy with 12 to 14. Okay. <laughs> I think we're happy with that. Um, okay, so over to the topic of the day. Today... We're going to dive in into the frustrations that immigrants experience in this part of the world regarding our academic backgrounds and professional backgrounds not being acknowledged or recognized for an easy transition here in Canada. If you're an immigrant like myself, I'm sure you've experienced that one way or the other. Myself, for example, I was in the university, um, Fabry College University, one of the oldest universities in Sierra Leone, woot, 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 before I left. And when I came here, 
I had to do some upgrades, high school upgrades, grade 12 upgrades, to be able to start from the very bottom and walk my way up to where I'm at right now. And the frustrations in that regard are real. Jade is here today to talk to us about her own experience in the, um, in the academic area as well. And Juliet is here to talk to us about her experience in the professional area. I'm going to pass it over to them to dive just a little bit into what that experience has been like for you before we go on to the next question. Oh, thank you, Patricia, for bringing this up. This is a very, very sensitive and interesting topic to always talk about. And I'm always passionate when I talk about it based on my own experiences. Just to get into a country where you know that all languages and all maybe all this, the, the things you've learned in school is from the colonized world. And then you come to an area where the colonizers find themselves at times and then they tell you that, oh, you don't have the academic or the credentials that are valued to our system so you have to start like you see yourself going back to step one or starting from the beginning so I was really shocked when I came the first shock I had was being told that my English was not valued when I had studied all my life like using the English was my it's my first language mm -hmm. I've never known any other language in school than English mm -hmm. and I was told that you have to prove your, uh, your English to us and I had to go back to Mackinac University and I did the university in English, which I was in school for four months. After four months, I was really happy. I had a good grade. This is an A plus in my English. And I'm like, what? okay, I'm good to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the English, I have to look for a mission to go to the next step. And then when I applied in the University of Calgary, and then they saw my English proficiency, they said, okay, bring the English. I, I, I said, I went to Maki when I, I got my transcripts and I went back to Calgary. I'm like, this is what I have. And then they said, um, we are not sure you have to write this research paper to prove this English. I was being given like a t 15 pages of um, a research paper to summarize in 500 words, and it gave me a timeline. Out of this frustration, I did a lot of advocacy on my part, but I had to still do that. Mm -hmm. And the day I submitted that paper, I wasn't still happy. I had to go to the school and I said, this is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. I had to pay so much money. I went to school for five months to do this English. So are you guys telling me that English at the university, like Makiwan University, is different from the English at University of Calgary? I need to get this straight. So wow. this, I think the whole system is kind of mixed up and confused because mm -hmm. if you can bring English from a different university still in Canada and they don't value it, then what's the point? And mm. I thought I had a frustration until somebody told me that they started studying in Canada at grade four, and I think grade four and still, this is like you study from grade four and then you reach the university and you're being told that you need to do English to prove yourself. Like, so I see my kids getting into this shock. Like, this is now no security for my own kids. I moved to Canada and studied from kindergarten. Means one day in the future, they're gonna ask them to prove their English. Okay, so is that just for immigrants? Like, even if you study here, when you get to university level, you still have to do um, English as a second language? That is what I'm, I'm getting because I've never heard like a Canadian or s somebody like a white person tell me that they have been asked to prove English. All of this comes from immigrants. Mm. So it's, I think it's like it's an immigrant problem. It's not even like a Canadian or white person's problem, which puts me in this p in position of advocacy all the time. Like, wait a minute, why just us? Why? Is it like you guys feel like the English we speak, even when you speak at times, I feel like that is not the, the right English you're you speaking. Like You have an accent. Yeah, <laughs> everybody yeah, has an accent. And I, had to say, <laughs> and I had to tell this girl in class when they were like, this accent thing, do you think you don't have one? We all have one. <laughs> like, why do you think your own is the best? Because, and I asked her like, why do you think Canadian in, or Canadian English in court or Canadian grammar is the best one? Mm -hmm. whoever said this is the best language or English that you guys speak. Mm -hmm. Because first, English is not my thing. As I said, um, my mother tongue, that's what I was raised with. Mm -hmm. I was speaking my mother tongue until when I got to school. Mm -hmm. And because of colonization and all of these languages came, I was forced to learn English. Mm -hmm. And I learned the English. I'm bringing back the same English I've learned from you guys. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me that this English is not what you want. 
So what are you telling me? So what right. you gave me, I'm giving you back and you're rejecting it. So it doesn't even make sense. Like we need to put things right. At times I usually tell them, you know what? You guys don't even understand what you want from us. But I believe there's something that you guys have to get. And I, this thing has to come to the table frequently for a lot what of advocacy to be done because I see my own children mm -hmm. going into the same problem in the future. Right, right. So that English as a second language was a me a major piece for you and I think um, having learned about your story a, a little bit I think even going into the university like having like the the education background that you had back in Cameroon was not necessarily um, accepted here and you had to go into a whole different sort of like because you've always wanted to do social work and you had to go into like the social work sort of like realm and um, study for three years before getting your your uh, masters in social work so all of that for you has been a journey which we will come back to um, and I do um, identify with the English piece as well because I had to do English as a second language, <laughs> language too yeah. and I was like come on people <laughs> back home they say I speak really good English so I don't know what you guys are talking about <laughs> <laughs> but we had to do it right and you're absolutely right because back home English is the language you speak in school. school, if yeah. for any reason you talk Creole, you are either mocked or flogged. Or flogged, yeah. Because how dare you talk any other language or speak, speak any, any other, other language, language than English in school. But we'll come back to that. Over to you, Juliet. What's been your experience in that professional area? Thank you, Patricia, for this uh, topic. Mm -hmm. For me, as a professional, coming to Canada and getting to search for a job was very challenging. Number one, you see the outlined job description in the job advert, and you are like, please excuse me, I have 15 years of experience. Where are these coming from? Mm -hmm. They list like 15, and you are only familiar with like four. Mm -hmm. And you're already grading yourself. And you are stuck between identifying those skills from home that you could transfer to fit the job description. And you are just talking, you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Another aspect is the issue of qualification. Mm. It's either you're overqualified or you're underqualified. underqualified yeah. So I found myself, I have masters from back home and getting here, you see job adverts, what they will list is what you can do, what you have done, and you will see required qualification, high school diploma. Mm -hmm. So I brought it up in one job fair and someone said you could apply. So I applied and I did the first interview. I wrote exams and after I didn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to the HR and I just got sorry, we couldn't move on with you. So I took it up, I was digging deeper and mm. one HR director now told me that you are overqualified for that job. Ah. After seven weeks ah. of write this Digging. exam, do this interview, do that. But I realized that the moment they asked for my um, West certificate, mm -hmm. I turned it in and they saw masters and that was the end. Mm. I didn't hear anything. Mm. So that is another challenge. Another major challenge is experience. Mm -hmm. I had 15 years experience from back home, but they are not seeing it. As 15? As, they are not even seeing it as experience. Not at all? They are not seeing it. I started, my resume started getting attention when I started volunteering. Here in Canada. Here in Canada. And I referenced those volunteering services uh, and what I did. So, except for maybe the job advert they have tried and they just want, they just want to fill it up. Mm -hmm. That is when they just, okay, let's just have this person with the mind that you are going to be trained. But that, that your experience you are bringing from back home will count. Well, for me, I'm talking for myself, 
I I see it as <laughs> it's better I remove this experience and just right. start from beginning. And this is so your experience. That is my experience. Mm -hmm. Another major challenge is competition. Yes. You know, one job adverts you may find over <laughs> 200 applicants applying for so it. you have to prove yourself mm -hmm. so the competitions sometimes can be very stiff and you just get overwhelmed you are just you are new in in this environment mm -hmm. just trying to find your feet and you are just subject to this stiff competition mm -hmm. so those are the major challenges i experience and as we continue in the discussion we will keep building and adding more Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. You touched on really key points there, Juliet. So the experience is one thing. The experience that you have back home is not recognized as experience, experience here. Yes. The competition is huge. huge um, yes. And your qualifications, qualifications are either over or, or under. under. Having yes. it just right yes. has not seemed to be your reality y yes. yet. Um, thank you very much for sharing that. And I think the reason why I personally thought this conversation is necessary here and now yeah. on the Dim Din podcast is because I know lawyers, doctors, yes. or people at least who were that back in the countries of Africa before they transitioned here. Yes. And they're working in group homes. Okay, concerning that, I was going to talk about education too. Okay. So education back home is seen as Less quality, not up to standard, not well supervised, mm. not well delivered. It's seen by us or seen by the Western world? Seen by the Western world. Okay, okay. So what we see as professionals is that you are either coming to start afresh, mm. if you don't have any Western world education. Like for me, I didn't have any, but for my husband, he had UK. Mm. He had his master's in UK, mm -hmm. which was a plus for him, okay. which it was a game changer in his own story. Okay. But for me, I had all my qualifications in Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's been seen as not, not up to standard. Mm -hmm. So education, that is why you see our doctors working in group homes, working with CRA mm -hmm. to just get balance before they now, if they still want to continue in their career, mm -hmm. they go back to school. So education, the Western education is way far above what we are bringing from back home. Mm -hmm. So that is what I say in the education. And your certificate is almost, if you don't have Western world certificate, mm -hmm. is, is close to paper. To them, that's how they see it. Mm -hmm. Because here, they also value experience. So they will tell you that four years experience is the same thing as four years degree. Mm -hmm. So someone who does not go to the university and has four years experience is coming to compete with you because he's also qualified. So experience match up with education here. Mm -hmm. So and if you don't have Western World Certificate, then you are at disadvantage. Because people who have Western experience is also coming. Mm -hmm. And they will value that, value that experience over your certificate you are bringing from back home. Always. Yeah. Always. That's, that's a really beautiful point. And, and I think some people will say, well, if you didn't want to experience that, you should have just stayed back in your country. I hear you, right? Um, because, of course, we all have our various countries and, they, and life goes on in those countries yeah. as well. But one thing that I have seen, I don't know about Nigeria and Cameroon, but one thing that I observed in Sierra Leone is, if anybody comes from the Western world to Sierra Leone, I don't even care if you don't have a bachelor's degree. You are put on a pedestal when you're searching for jobs or you want to get some kind of an experience. Mm -hmm. You're seen as a better person like you know better, like you know it all, and that adding you to that team is in the interest of the team. Team, yes. So that pedestal remains a pedestal, mm -hmm. whether you're in the Western world yeah. or in yeah. some parts of Africa, because I cannot yes. speak to all parts of Africa, but this yes. is something that I experienced in Sierra Leone, yes. right? So for me, the frustration comes from, if we can see that, regardless of whether or not you studied in our country, 
you come with knowledge and we can make room to embrace and, and walk with that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Why is there such a steep process that's been put in place for those who you say, because they say Canada is, is not a melting pot, mm -hmm. it's a mosaic or so, yes. I think, and you, and you embrace diversity and all of that. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, why do we have to go through all of this extremely, in my, from my point of view, I would say to an extent unnecessary process to be seen and acknowledged as part of the community? Jade, I'm coming back to you with like, can you speak to some of the frustrations that we experience in that process? Yeah, um, I, would, I really appreciate you bringing up us we're coming others like from the western world western education in africa is so valued like someone's like oh they study in canada they study in the u.s they study in the uk and they come back to cameroon they're giving all these high high level jobs and they are having like how like this is the best candidates we have and you that have even studied back in cameroon that they know their, their own education they look at you like the person coming with this western education is more qualified than you and coming back to, to Canada, our own experiences, just understanding that you're bringing all of this, this is education, this is time you've been in school, and this is not valued, in trying to navigate it, to try to just get from, as Judith, uh, Julia said, getting a job, you're bringing all of this, oh, they said they need a diploma, oh, I have a degree, I don't have a diploma, and you send off, um, out all of these resumes and nobody's calling you and when they call you and you say oh I have like out of country degree they say okay we're gonna get back to you and nobody ever gets back to you mm. and you feel like maybe you didn't perform well in the interview because it comes with a lot of confusion at times because you don't even know where, where, where you went wrong is it my education that is the problem is it my accent that is the problem is it my qualification that is the problem? Because at times I usually say like, good companies at times, they'll be honest with you, they'll tell you where the problem is, but some they will just, they'll just tell you like, unfortunately, you are not the right candidate for this position. But they will not tell you what was the problem with you. Mm -hmm. And you go back there and you're like, okay, now I need to do something. Mm -hmm. And you find yourself trying to go back to educate yourself within okay, I want to get this Canadian education. The worst one is the Canadian experience. I come to Canada, I'm just a month old in Canada. I'm looking for a job, and you call me for a job interview, and you're asking me about Canadian experience. <laughs> Where do you want me to give you Canadian yes. experience? I just came. Like, I'm just Manufacture one. it from yeah, somewhere. <laughs> like, I just have, I'm just in Canada for a month. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me about Canadian experience, truly you don't want to give me the job. Because it's true you're giving me that job that I'm going to get that experience. And if employers are looking at that from that lens, it means you're going to stay in Canada forever without working. And then now the ones that have seen that, okay, these are jobs, like you said, for group homes. Mm -hmm. Some of them will look like, depending on the position, some of them look at the education, but I've seen some that they would just like, they don't need education. They just need kind of experience or they will train you in the job. But I don't know how I'm gonna, someone is gonna study in Africa for seven years to become a doctor and come to Canada and they can't even get, they go right down to the level. Of, I'm not like minimizing like group homes are not good, mm -hmm. but you can, that is a qualification that can take you higher to a job that you, you earn. Like this is seven years of studying to be a doctor. And it's so frustrating when I hear even from doctors that have studied back in Africa for seven years, they're telling me that they come here, they have to challenge exams, and then they go back to school, they study again for at least five years before they become doctors. Mm -hmm. Means what happened to the seven years then? Was not valid. Yes, <laughs> it was not valid. It was not valid, it was yeah. not valid. But really, 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 really good points there. Um, Juliet, coming to you, I've had people say, and again, this is not Patricia saying, it's not hmm. Becca saying. I've had people say, the system is strategically designed to keep some of us in that leveled area so that there are people to do the jobs that the Western borns may not want to do. Okay. Because if we 
if our qualifications are recognized, if our education are, rec are recognized, because we value education yes. very highly back home. Yeah. And to be honest with you, when I compare the education that I went through in Africa compared to that which I have gone through here, education here is way more easier. Yes. Because there's a lot of resources mm -hmm. that are um, available to you. Whereas back home, you have to read five, five, five pages, and you make sure you, <laughs> you better be sure you have them stuck in your head yes. for your exam, mm -hmm. right? And we're taking like 13, 14 subjects on a go. On a go. Whereas, yeah, you have the choice to go for three or five, right? So I think pressure-wise, it's a lot more heavier back home, which in my, in my opinion, should make even our education a lot more valuable. Yes. From my, in my opinion. So speaking to that perception, that this could be a systemic strategy to keep us in a leveled place so as to leave the higher class jobs for the Westerners. What do you have to say to that? Okay, I, for me, I would say it all depends on what you want. Mm -hmm. What uh, goal do you want to achieve in the system? Mm -hmm. So if you want to follow your passion, Canada will encourage you. Okay. You can start something. Mm -hmm. If you want to continue in your career, mm -hmm. your professional career, then you may look at upskilling your qualification, which was what I did. That was the uh, path I followed. Okay. So I landed in Winnipeg, and in Winnipeg, opportunities are narrow. Okay. And we have more immigrants. So... What I did, I looked at it that, okay, do I want to do, go to care home? That is not what I want to do. I'm not saying it not, it's not good, mm -hmm. but that is not what I want to do. Do I want to follow my passion? Yes, I can do that as side hustles. Mm -hmm. But I still want to follow my professional career. Mm -hmm. So what I did was that I looked at it as a business analyst. I need to upscale. Okay. Because looking at job uh, adverts, you will see software and application. I'll be like, what is R? <laughs> As in, you will see R, my SQL, SQL, Python, uh, so many softwares. Mm -hmm. And you're like, is this not what I've been doing? Mm -hmm. So I was now I, now, I now said, I'm not going to just rest in my hours. I want to move out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So I registered for, for trainings. So I did trainings for eight months to learn the new tools, to learn how it is done here. And while doing that, I was volunteering. Mm -hmm. So if you need Can Canadian experience, I could say, OK, from my volunteering job, I have done something mm -hmm. here in Canada Why I'm still training myself. So that was what I did. So the system where, the system is open to whatever you want. Mm -hmm. If you want the professional job, go for it. But our major challenge is, where I, in Winnipeg then people were saying, it's because you have the resources. I don't have the resources, but I know what I wanted. I was not working for like 10 months. Mm -hmm. I didn't earn a dime. But I know that this is what I want. If I go for what I want, the money will come after. Mm -hmm. I was going to work every day, freely, volunteering. Then weekend, I do my studies. I go, I attend my trainings. So it depends on what we want. So if you just want to be here, some of the immigrants get here and they are just okay. They are just okay. They just want to earn their dollars, pay their bills. Why some come here that, okay, there are opportunities here. I could take up my career from this level to this level. Mm -hmm. Some people want to be on that interna international pedestrian. So they see it as opportunity. Let me upskill. Let me go to school. Let me compete. But if we run away from the competition, then we'll just be where we are. Beautiful, beautiful. So what I hear you say then is that the system is there. However, 
we do have a choice yes. as to whether we want to give in to the system, to the system. or we want to go over go the over, system. Yes. And I, 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 I do appreciate that because I know for myself when I came, even though I was, I said I, I was at the university when I left yes. and I had to go through like the upscaling. Yes. I know at some point I probably had two jobs as I was going to school. And I walked my way up, down from uh, health care aid certificates to a diploma in social work, to a bachelor's in social work, to a master's That's degree sense. in social work. Yeah. And now I feel like I'm at a place where I can compete, like yes. you say. Mm -hmm. I have the experience alongside Side, the yes. education that's accepted in this part of the world. Yes. But some people will say they don't have the luxury, <laughs> the luxury of <laughs> to time. do that, yeah, right? Because yeah. I can say that I had my parents here who I relied on financially yes. before I got to that place where I could provide for myself. So I had the luxury to do that in, in, in that lens, right? So, but some people come with their families. They don't have, they, they would argue, they don't have the time to go to work, go to school and still be able to pay the bills, take care of the children, pay the school fees and all of those things. So because of that, even though they came with all their qualifications, they came with all their experiences, they had to settle for what the system had to offer, not by choice, but because they felt stuck in that system. Jane. You're right. Um, like, I would agree with you. Like, I went to school, like Patricia was there. Uh, I was completing my master's. I had three kids. I was pregnant in the process. I had Heavily a baby. pregnant, big. I had a baby <laughs> in the process. And I would tell you that was not easy. But as you said, we have a choice if you want to give it into the system mm -hmm. or go above and get that. But um, there are times when I would say, like, people are there that are willing to do all of those things. Okay, now they want me to have masters before I can have this job. But there's still lots of barriers. As I said, like, the English stuff, it's a barrier. Mm -hmm. This is a big barrier for some people to challenge that because you go in, you have the English, maybe you didn't have, like, you had in a different university, like, like I did, and I went to get me this paper. If I was that person that give up easily, I would say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm going to freak out, right? It's, more, it's frustrating to go through all those barriers to go back to school. to school. And then you have to order, like, they want your credentials sent, mailed directly to the university. university. You have to contact your university back in Africa to tell them, I want my credentials emailed straight to the school. I remember when I, I, I did the first year when I was offered the opportunity to do the child youth care um, mm -hmm. degree program. When I ordered my university transcripts from my country, they mailed it, because they gave me the tracking number, they mailed it to Imakiwan University. I saw that each time I would check in the to-do list, I saw that this transcript uh, was still there, it wasn't taken off. So I called them, I'm like, I see that DHL delivered this transcript. And the good thing was I had this tracking number and I had the person that signed for it, because I saw it online. And they said, no, they haven't received it. And I was, at that time I was pregnant for my third baby. Like I had to go through all of this. I did the English when I, I just had the third baby. Mm -hmm. And I did my master's when I just had the fourth baby. She's so, not joking. So, yeah. so you can imagine <laughs> the stress that the system gave me mm -hmm. with having, have, having to be a mom and having to go to school and having to bridge all of these barriers. I had to go to school. I'm like, hey, this transcript was delivered here. This is the person's name. They knew the name, they acknowledged that. And somebody went and did about 30 minutes and came back and told me, okay, yeah, we found it. And they took that off the to-do list. I finished that. And then at the end, when I, I sat and then I've given up, I had my baby, they called me one evening and said, oh, you've been offered not the social work program, but you've been offered the opportunity. Which was my second choice? Because you're so confused, you have to pick a second choice. So the child you'd care was my second choice. And that was what they gave you. And it gave me that to do for four years to get a degree when I was applying with a degree I did for three years. So I'm like, I already mm. have a degree. Why should I go back into a degree, a program? degree program? I told them, you know what, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna get back to you the, the following day. And the following day I called them, I said, you know what? I, I'm not accepting the offer. You can give it to another person. So at the end of the day, it's not like we don't want to try. Mm -hmm. We try at times, but it's so challenging. And at times they offer you what you don't need. Because yeah. they are thinking that that is what you or your credentials back home are reflecting. I, I, which is not okay. Beautiful. So yes. we want to get all of this done. 
But this, yeah, there's a lot of pushback from the system, and you don't imagine me coming now. Like some people are coming here where they're already having th this big family. They have to feel like I was going to school in my masters. I bet you I had five jobs. I was pregnant. Literally. I had five <laughs> jobs, and I was doing a master's program. Because mm -hmm. in the processes, you have to make a living. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The abuse yeah. is still there. Yeah. And you're going, it's not easy. Yes. yes. So I agree with you. Like, we are trying, but I, I'll keep saying that it's not easy. Easy, uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Wonderful. So to round this up, um, we want to send a message to the system, but at the same time, we also want to send a message to our brothers and sisters who are coming in, yes. who are probably going to experience these frustrations for the first time and may get sucked in to the frustration and not be able to go over this frustration. I know, starting with our brothers and sisters, I know I had to send my qualifications through um, ICOS, I I ICOS, ICOS, but it's, um, it's a system that sort of like translates your the West, I think the West yeah. one. Yeah. Yes. For, for you. Western Education West. System. Yeah. I, th I think it's called ICAS or something. But, but anyways, this is a group of people you don't know, you've never met, you don't even meet them. <laughs> you just yes. email, email yes. your, your, your documents yes. to them. And then they send you back yes. a record of what they believe your qualifications Canadian translated in the Canadian system. You have nobody to ask questions, because I had nobody to ask questions. Yes. I, I just saw from 80, maybe 60, from 70, maybe yeah, that. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And that is all, that is what you use then to submit to the school. Mm -hmm. And the school will still ask you to go do ELS, mm -hmm. um, English as English, a second language, yes. which is a whole lot of stressor and financial uh, yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. as well, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to pay for yes. all of these things. Mm -hmm. To our brothers and sisters who are coming in or who are here and chose to settle or don't know the right path to go through True. to be able to overcome the system, yes. what can you say to them? Okay. For me, for the English part, but I wrote the exam back from Nigeria. I, in fact, as a PR, <laughs> You need to write your English exam before you leave your country. Ah. So I wrote my English exam from Nigeria, everything done before I left. So um, I could remember we were on one group on Telegram where they sent employment um, counselors, contact government uh, employment counselors. Mm -hmm. So I registered for one SOPA. So I had my first... Um, meeting with them from Nigeria, mm. where they told me about how to search for a job. Just like a little hand holding. Then when I landed, they referred me to Manitoba Stats in Winnipeg then, mm. where they taught us how to write resume, how to tailor your resume, because you have, to, it's back, in, back home, we have one resume fits all. Mm -hmm. So, but here, if you're applying for 100 jobs, you need 100 resumes. resumes. <laughs> so there they taught us how to tailor our resume to fit the job advert and all that. They told us about volunteering. Mm. So there are good resources by the government, and those services are free. And that's back home? No. Here? Here. In Manitoba? In Manitoba. Oh, when I got to Edmonton, mm -hmm. I also went to the Breeding Center for the career bread in b r e d i n ah. for career advancement it's oh, also they are funded by government and it's free services so those services are available mm -hmm. when you get there they would for professionals like me i even apply that i want to write my certification if they could help me pay mm -hmm. from their funding I'm still waiting for a response though. <laughs> okay. So I, I have somebody that I was attached to a professional mm -hmm. who, um, if I do a resume, will go through it, vis-a-vis -vis the job advert to make sure that I have said the right thing that could get me um, at least opportunity to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. So we have those uh, programs available for free by the government. That is one area we can look at. Another thing is, like I said earlier, we have to define our goals mm. in the system. What do you want? What do you want to do? 
those qualifications back from uh, home, those experiences, is that what you want to continue or do you still want to, do you just want to start something and as you go, as situation changes, you define exact thing you want to do. Mm -hmm. Then another thing that could help is volunteering, like I said. Don't wait. Don't wait. Mm -hmm. Start volunteering as soon as you land, as soon as time permits. Mm -hmm. Just look for what is close to what you were doing. And, and there's one thing about this volunteering thing. Because they know that we are new, they tend to give us high positions. Like in Winnipeg, I was a council member. Mm -hmm. So in my resume, saying that I'm a council member of Manitoba Genealogical Society. And if you go to their website, you Google my name, you see me there sitting on their council as a board member. Was that given to you because of the experience you had back home? Experience education. Okay, okay. okay. So here in Edmonton, I... So they can recognize it for volunteerism, but not for a job. Yes, yes they can. <laughs> like, 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 like they give us, like those positions are there because people are busy, mm -hmm. mostly board, uh, in their board, mm -hmm. councils, VP, AVP, all those positions are there and people are busy, but because you are new, you are available, you could attend to their needs. Mm -hmm. They just slam you with one big position. Of course. And you'll be doing it and you never can tell. Mm -hmm. And there are connections too. During volunteering, you, you have connections. Like the job I'm doing now, mm -hmm. it was through volunteering. I volunteered first. And when there was an opening, they said, ah, no, we are not going to leave our volunteer. Then are you interested? I said, I'm interested. Then Beautiful. I got interviewed for the job. Beautiful. Wow. And Beautiful. that's what I'm doing now. Okay. So volunteering is very key. Okay. okay. So another thing we can do is let's prepare. Like, for coming. Like in uh, back home, I think my, my first job was given to me in the church. As, this sister... I see you love children. Can you come teach in my school? Mm -hmm. That was it. Then the other one, my mom saw my uncle at the village, a board chairman, and said, take my daughter's uh, resume. resume. Mm -hmm. And he called me and he said, and he gave me complimentary card. And he said, go to this place. Mm -hmm. But here, it's not going to happen. And you I think it does use? happen here too, but it's who you know. It's who you know, <laughs> yes. It's who you know. That is why... When you, when you start volunteering, you get to start meeting people, you get involved, Absolutely. you start making connections. Yes. Beautiful. So we have to prepare for, in, if you have interview, please prepare. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. So prepare. Um, and, volunteer. And volunteer. Define your goal. Define your goals. Go for employ, uh, employment empowering centers like Beautiful. Breading. They have everywhere. We have in all provinces, in all cities they have. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful, wonderful. Jade, to round us up, right, um, I've had people say, although they say our qualifications are not necessarily accepted here or not recognized here, like nurses and doctors who have to wait to go through a system to be qualified or to be recognized here, when there is um, a pandemic of some sort or when there's a need for these people, the government does find ways to qualify them. <laughs> Even yes. though they don't go through that pathway but, that they have set. Yes. So I, I have heard this argument that the government has its way of doing things when it works for them. For them. For them. But not when it's in our best interest. Mm -hmm. Having heard all of what we've said, what message do you want to send to the system with regards to that? I just want to um, send this message out that we are not to be used when we are needed, but we have that potential to give a lot to this country, and we should be given those opportunities to, pro to provide or to bring forth what we have for this country, because we come in here with a lot of skills, with a lot of knowledge, education into these countries, and unless you are given that opportunity to prove yourself, then they will not know who you are, because I believe like most people come in here into this country and they just sit with all these potentials and skills in them. As you said, if they go volunteering, they can be discovered and given that opportunity to give it out there. So we just come here. You guys think that we are coming just to 
to for greener pastures, as we said. Mm -hmm. We usually say, oh, we are going abroad for greener pastures, and we have all these goals that we want to achieve. But please give us opportunities to prove ourselves. And also for those coming in, I'm going to tell you that um, it's not easy, but it's doable. As Juliet said, you have to identify what you want to do. It's not all about going to school here because there are people that have, that have gone to school. They study what they don't even like just because they wanted to get Canadian education. And at the end of the education, they finish, they have the degrees or they have all the certificates, but they can't work in that field because they felt like they needed to go to school because they have been told to go to school to get Canadian education. That is not what is needed. I'm glad that I, I declined the Chinese youth. Mm -hmm. Her offer that they were, I was offered because I wanted social work. It took me years again to get that admission. I had to work on it to get what I wanted. Mm -hmm. So be, be careful what you want to go do in school because it's not everything that you do that is really selling out there. You have to do your investigations, go to the centers that are there offering resources for free. I know people go to Service Canada, they're giving this chunk of papers, they just go, they dump it in their homes. But there's a lot of information written there. I'm sorry to say, when I was in school, they said if you want to hide something from people, put it in the paper or put it in the book <laughs> because they will not see it. <laughs> yes. not see and it. I see it every day mm -hmm. for people that come, newcomers that have tried to integrate them into the system. And I would talk and they wouldn't like me for that. But I usually say like, you are giving all of these papers what have you read in those papers? And they look at me and they're like, there's nothing there. I'm like, there's something there. This Beautiful. Sorry, the Western man is, the, like I usually say, the white man is not stupid. They gave you that paper for a reason. There are resources there. Go read and go out there and make yourself useful. Beautiful. Because you can't just stay home and think that there's nothing there. Yeah, the system is hard, but you need to work on yourself at times. Don't be lazy and thinking that you're just going to get it because you came to a new country with a mindset that you're going for green and pasture. You cannot make it green if you don't water it. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yes. my goodness. You <laughs> cannot make it green if you don't yeah. water it. That is what we're ending with. Beautiful topic, beautiful conversation. To the system, we want to tell, say thank you, first of all, for all of the, the opportunities and... Uh, the resources that you have created for those of us coming into the country to learn a little bit about your country and learn a little bit about how to go through that transition process. At the same time, we want to ask you to hold hands with us. Back in my country, I would say when a white man visits, and, and this is real, I used to have a very hard time um, understanding what the white man says. And we would listen for the last word. So when they go do, do, do water, we're like, oh, maybe this person wants to drink water and we go and fetch water for them. But we made an effort, we made a genuine effort to listen to what you have to say so that we can respond and communicate with you. And that's all we're asking for in return. We all, most of these African countries are either Afro, um, Franco, or Anglo-colonized countries. We had to learn English or French, right? So to come here and still hear that uh, accent is a barrier to communication or to us getting the jobs that we have worked back home and are hoping to transition to. It's very frustrating and it's not welcoming. And we all know that the saying is that Canada is a very welcoming country. We want to feel that, we want to experience that. We want to hold hands with you to get what we know. We can contribute very relevantly too, if that's even a word. <laughs> <laughs> and to the brothers and sisters, you have heard what the sisters here have to say. Use the resources that are put in place for you. Um, there was something that I had to go through, a chance to choose. It's a program that also does something similar. Mm. That's something that I'm hoping some immigrants' communities can implement as well. I am in the process of implementing that. And opportunities like this also brings you this information. I'd like to send a quick shout out to Hinga Hair. I'll put the rest of the information for, for her salon on the screen here for you to see. But she also helps with my hair, and she's an amazing hair doer. So please make time to visit her to get your hair needs done. Thank you, ladies, for joining us for this conversation. Thank it's you. been amazing. And until our next episode, Sabe Sandindin. Sabe Sandindin.